have something oh, else. Oh. Jamron. But I'm Turu. Welcome back, everyone, to a special edition of the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. We'll cut right through the preview today because we've lost the giant of studies, particularly in the Western system of university education, but also someone who's undoubtedly a product of the traditional schools of Ethiopia to give Memher Geta Chohaile a proper zikr or tezkar or commemoration. I have with me here, Deacon Mahari. Welcome back to the program. Thank you, Enoki. Okay. Thank you so much. It's good to be back. What what can we say in beginning to touch upon him? I don't presume, and I I think I could speak on your behalf and say that you won't presume to try to list every one of his accomplishments in in this space. We're doing this very off the cuff, off the fly. I put Deacon Mahari on the spot. <laughs> Uh, as I'm sure other people have pressured him to just because of the nature. We actually usually reserve this time slot for our own side projects, which we can say are influenced by and contributing to the larger legacy of Professor Geta Chohaile. But um, Deacon Mahari, what, what, what is a good way to start off? What are a few gurshauch that we can give <laughs> people about <laughs> Professor Geta it really is humbling. Like first, I, I have to confess, like it really is um, very. Um, it's a it's a very hard task to enumerate all his accomplishments and his achievements and his excellence. I think it's um, yeah. I I really don't consider myself to be that competent to to uh, to express all his achievements and his excellence. Yatacho Haile was not just a scholar. He was not just one among the many, no. He was a man in whom lived the Ethiopian manuscripts, I would prefer to say. He was not just a cataloger. He was a catalog himself, like the whole catalog, the whole Ethiopian uh, tradition written in Ge'ez, it seems to live in him, I think. Because when you look at what, uh, like his publications, uh, honestly, I have to confess, I haven't read all of his publications because they are so numerous. <laughs> I haven't got through them. <laughs> I have been reading him for a while and I still have a long way to go. There is a lot that he has published. and. He's, he started publishing like before I even was born, before my mom and dad was <laughs> were married. <laughs> so his, his achievements, his um, excellence is honestly beyond my capacity to summarize and uh, to explain it to people in very brief manner, I, I really. I don't think uh, if we, let's pause here because this is an interesting point that you brought up. So I've read maybe a tenth of what you've read, and you haven't read all his publications. And I've I've read a few of his articles, particularly of interest to me were the Stephanites, but I've read several of his articles, even on things like old Amharic, just to see, you know, what he said on, on the subject. But the the big books of his that I own are his his book on learning Giz, Giz Bakalalu for people who know Amharic already. And uh, again, his book on the Stephanites, which is itself a compilation of, of many of the different, the, the Gadlats, the hagiographies from both points of view, from the point of view of Emperor Zarayakob, as well as the point of view of Abbas Tifanos. Of course, the Abbas Tifanos side is calling him Dibsar or the enemy and the uh, wolf or the hyena or the bear or whatever that weird word or animal is. And then of course, on the emperor Zarayakob side, referring to the other side as a demon, as a stifa. And so these, uh, these different perspectives probably aren't the whole truth, but by having this, this comparison between them, I think he, he helps us learn a lot 
Whereas a lot of times it may be just one side or the other that is being presented. And I think the, the genuine voice of the church is usually found uh, between these two, which I think have been almost competing as competing spirits throughout the, the ages and, and, and the centuries. I know my father also has his book, Bahara Hassab, which talks about the unique calendar, although there are similarities. Uh, I don't like when people try to say it's so Julian or Gregorian. No, no, no. Really, there's a unique Gez contribution. And of course, uh, the word is different politics now, but uh, let's say uh, the Zenahu book, uh, the book by Abba Bahari about the original Oromo um, expansion, migration, whatever word you use is going to be considered uh, disagreeable by, by somebody. So those are the kind of works that I know in terms of big books, but as you've said, the, the publications are so numerous. Can you tell us a little bit about this cataloging? Because I know one of the things that he did that was just a sheer and uh, immense project was this idea of cataloging. For those who don't know, what does it mean, like cataloging manuscripts and, and digitizing it? Like they may kind of be familiar or they might have heard these words, but they might not know precisely what that means. And I know it's something that you do. Yes, so cataloging is um, it's studying a text, a man, like let's let's say a codex or a scroll or a manuscript. It's studying that manuscript and uh, enumerating what is in that manuscript. When was that manuscript written? Who wrote it? What are the texts that are inside? What tendency is there? Like, is there something uh, uh, that specifically uh, con tries to contextualize the text we are reading, uh, like theological tendencies, political tendencies that are expressed right away? So it is, to put it simply, it is a, the study of a manuscript or a text, a particular scroll is what we call cataloging. So you enumerate uh, systematically uh, what that text is from its size all the way to its content. And after doing that, you make it available for further research. Now, we like once a book is, a, a manuscript is cataloged, uh, the, uh, the next researcher knows what is in that manuscript? So if they want to do any uh, research on a particular area that is uh, somehow uh, included in that manuscript, the cataloger has already laid the foundation so they don't have to do the, the um, laborious work of cataloging. The, the laborious work of studying the manuscript and trying to go through which manuscript has what I want because the cataloger has already done that. And it's, if you go to libraries, um, usually that's where you go to the, like the, the, if you are looking for a book, you go to the catalog and look, to, look through the catalog to find if the, the, the book that you are looking for is there, or if there is anything that's written on the theme or the subject you are thinking in that library, you go to the catalog and the catalog tells you. So cataloging is basically doing that, making, studying the manuscript or the text and making it accessible to further research. And Geha Chohaili did that. And that was one of his greatest contributions to Ethiopian studies generally, because uh, in the 1970s, it, uh, there was this project of uh, microfilming Ethiopian manuscripts, and Gitach Wiley was involved in that. Uh, also, was Sir Gohavles and Lassi. And most of the manuscripts uh, we have now, like as um, microfilms, they were catalog. They, they were um, recorded, microfilmed, at that time back in the 1970s. After that, after that, like we have recently, there have been uh, multiple digitization projects, uh, at least two or three. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly how many. I think three of the, at least that I know. And 
I am not sure if any of those digitization projects have really given a copy. I know one of them did, I, I heard that one of them did, but the rest, I don't think they gave any copy of the digitized manuscripts to any Ethiopian institu institution that I know of. Because very recently I asked somebody who was, uh, who had some um, authority in the Patriarchate back in Addis, uh, the, the, the library of the Patriarchate. I asked them, like, do you have any uh, like any copy of the digitization projects that we are going on? And he said, what digitization? <laughs> so like, what? <laughs> For me, it was like, what? No, please don't know. But that was the reaction uh, I found. So I, I, I think, yeah, the Gitacho Haile did a tremendous contribution. He, he, he gave it, he gave us a huge contribution first by through the microfilming project. And second, uh, after he left Ethiopia, when the Derg came to power, he was, uh, wonder, it's a long story. If you want, you, you can read his biography and Daftal Ogachu. It's a beautiful biography. Gethacho Haile can write, by the way. <laughs> he's a very good writer. Uh, he's a very good storyteller. And um, you can read that for all the details. But once he moves to the US, um, now he's, uh, movement-wise, he's limited. Uh, so there were a, a number of hardships that he had to go through. But he started cataloging uh, all, this manu all these manuscripts in um, St. John's University, HMML, the Himal Library. The, um, it's a beautiful uh, collection. Like they have thousands and thousands of um, manuscript microfilms in that collection. And Gita Chohaili uh, became in charge of cataloging these Ethiopian manuscripts with other people uh, like, I think, um, William F. Macomber and Gita Chohaili. They too became involved in this uh, cataloging. And Gita Chohaili did a huge contribution in that by cataloging almost I, as far as I know, I think every single probably every single um, microfilmed manuscript in that collection, I think, maybe it's my guess, I don't know, but he, he has how many volumes he has of the catalogs. Uh, he also uh, did some uh, other cataloging with uh, uh, another group that came out in four volumes, I think. So yes, you're yeah, actually the, the one at UCLA. Yeah, the one at UCLA. Yes, he did that in collaboration with the the head of preaching at my local parish, Lika mm -hmm. Huran, mm -hmm. Malaku. Yes, yes, yes. Lika Huran and uh, Dennis not Smith. Was it Dennis? No, not Dennis. No, no, another person. Mm, yeah, Steve De La Marta, who's Doctor Steve De La Marta, Father Kasis Malaku, uh, Father uh, Malaku, Lika Huran. Uh, and a couple other people probably, yeah. And he, he did it. He, his contribution is immense, honestly. Um, and Gaetacho also was a linguist by training. His PhD was, uh, if I remember correctly, from his biography. I read it like how many years ago now? <laughs> so uh, I don't remember all the, de the details of it, but um, he did his PhD in uh, Semitic studies and he had to study all these different Semitic languages. And by training, he is a linguist. However, his background is theology. What makes it more interesting is his background is theology and his father was a Marigeta. He was a Yekani Mamher. So uh, if I remember correctly, Bahar Hassab and Kani Gitacho studied from his father. He didn't have to go anywhere. <laughs> he even thanks him. He even uh, thanks his father, uh, Kain Geta, I think, yeah, Kain Geta, uh, 
Haile, I think that's his title in the church. The Lord of the Right. Yes, the Lord of the, the Master of the Right. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the Master of the Right. So he thanks him for that. So he is a cultivated man. Like his cultivation in uh, Ethiopian scholarship and Ethiopian studies was a destiny for him. It, it began at home. <laughs> it began at home and he really was nourished in that and he continued it into a, a very successful and illustrious academic career, I think. He, he's a linguist. And oh, I just remembered one thing, Gidacho Haile, you, you know, he, were, he was a professor at Addis Ababa University. And back in uh, those days, Addis Ababa University, Department of uh, Ethiopian Languages and Literature, Amharic was, Amharic grammar was taught in Arabic. What? Yeah, it, it was, it's a very strange thing, yes. And they, they also had to teach, like every, the, the language of instruction was English. And I like the, for the whole university. So the, the, um, the no, they had to teach, Amharic in English, and they also used to learn Arabic. That's how it is, I think. Yeah, Memor if memory serves well. Today, it's all about memory. So <laughs> if anybody uh, checks facts and <laughs> comes back at me to giving corrections, I'd be very happy to, to accept the corrections, okay? Um, and Getacho started giving the courses in Amharic. He said, why in the world do I have to teach Amharic in English? <laughs> I, I heard that he changed it, like he changed the language of instruction into Amharic. I'm gonna teach Amharic in Amharic, period. That's it. <laughs> Ethiopian literature in Amharic. And the Giz, the Giz Bek I have it right here. This book, before, before it came like this, it, uh, he did it in a stencil. I don't know if you know stencil. What do you call it in English? The, 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 the old days, you know, the stencil. Addis Ababa University used his um, uh, type, like the typewriter written uh, his textbook, which was not published officially, but was prepared for uh, as a textbook for class, for his class. Addis Ababa University used that until <laughs> 2015, I think. That was the textbook Addis Ababa University used in the, Ethiopia, the Department of Ethiopian Language and Literature. The GIS classes were uh, using that, ma the, that manuscript, that um, manuscript, I would prefer to, uh, yes, to call it a manuscript, that manuscript of Gitacho Haile for how many years? 40, 50 years? <laughs> because it was it was such a great okay. work. Yeah, it, it was a very good work. And uh, like for anybody whose native tongue is Amharic or Tigrinya, you can like you can pick up that book and learn this very, very easily. You don't have to um, plow through very uh, difficult grammatical terms. It, it just makes it so easy. So uh, it, 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 was, it was the right thing to do, like to keep using that book was the right thing to do. I remember once all the books were, when I was a student, uh, an undergrad student, all the books were so old because they have been used and reused and reused in the department. So the, um, the Giz professor had to go to the Addis Ababa University Press and ask for uh, and, and like a reprint of these manuscripts and they did it for him gracefully. <laughs> and it was a great contribution for the student like at, at that time because of um, that really very cooperative spirit at Addis Ababa University Press, the students were able to have, I think each student was able to have his own book, his own textbook. It was it was uh, great. It was, it really was great, and I, I, I'm a witness for that. <laughs> I was one of those students who benefited from that um, very cooperative spirit between the, the professor and the university press. So, Gennaro Haley was um, a linguist also. 
and he also he's one of the people who changed it. if uh, I guess, according to the narrative I heard about uh, the Department of Ethiopian Languages and Literature back home, he was the one of the people who changed the language of instruction. <laughs> and mind you, at that time, even until very recently, there is no African university where African indigenous languages are used for uh, med as medium of instruction. None. And, but but Gitach was um, right and way, way ahead of his time in this regard. Uh, so, his uh, one one other thing about his being a linguist, when he reads Giz texts, Giz manuscripts, Getacho can tell you from which part of the country was the scribe of that manuscript. Seriously, if it if it is from uh, Tigray, he he can see it because of the accent, the the, the Tigrinya accent. That Tigrinya accent, he knows how it influences Giz and that, how that gets manifested in the manuscript. So he can tell you, this is quite likely, it's quite likely that this was written by a Tigrinya speaker. If it is a Fanoroma speaker, he can tell you that this probably is written by a person whose native tongue is a Fanoromo, or this, this is probably from Amharic, Amharic speaker. He can tell you that. This um, is a rare, a rare <laughs> skill in Ethiopian studies. Um, his contribution uh, to the Ethiopian historiography, I think, I'm not a historian, but the um, ma making manuscripts available and talking about all these historical figures in Ethiopia that are to be found in Ethiopian manuscripts. Getacho Haile, I think, challenged Ethiopian historiographers, Ethiopian historians, to go back and look at the sources instead of reading what other people like Ceruli and Rossini and all the other, the Italian guys who That's were trying, who were studying Ethiopia to colonize Ethiopia. And actually they did colonize Ethiopia. Like Rossini served in the Eritrea, in, uh, in the fascist regime as the Eritrean government uh, secretary. And Ceruli, the same thing in the fascist, uh, during the fascist occupation, he did um, uh, serve the fascist regime. They did a huge, huge, huge amount of publication. Like they have written extensively, but the purpose was to colonize and invade and subdue and exploit Ethiopia. And they said it explicitly. Okay. Uh, I think Gitacho Haile challenged Ethiopians to move beyond Ceruli and Rossini and all the other guys and look at the sources themselves. He also, I think, gave us access by cataloging all those manuscripts. And he also, uh, I think, inspired young generation to look at their own heritage as a historical document. For instance, when the, um, uh, <laughs> he was one of the people who used to very, very fiercely refute the historical narrative that was invented by the, the political, uh, the, this, the ethnocentric political elites. They, they, they have created the this regime narrative. from the 90s? Huh? Of the regime from the 90s? Yes, of the regime from the 90s and a part of like, yeah, the, and the regime from the 90s, it didn't come out of the blue. It came from all the way to back, it goes all the way back to uh, the 1960s and 70s, where you have these uh, young people who really do not know uh, their own, like the history of the country. And instead they try to understand the country according to some bits and pieces of um, ideologies they heard and they uh, read. 
uh, like Marxist theory, ma like Marxism and Stalin, like this. I, I particularly the issue of ethnic ethnic nationalism, whatever whatever they want to call it. That thing was uh, <laughs> kind of inaugurated by this guy called Walelli, and <laughs> what the, the model he took was from Stalin. And first of all, he did not understand Stalin. I think I, I don't think he understood Stalin very well because I don't think he understood Russia. <laughs> And Russia has its own history and Stalin was writing for Russians in a Russian way, and according to the Russian mindset, according to the history of Russia. Well, they didn't know about Russia. <laughs> he had very limited knowledge about Russia because he had never been to Russia or it like, how many people know about Russia? Russia was something that was not even included and studied in the Ethiopian curriculum. And second, all these young people of the 1960s, the, the they were divorced. They were divorced from the heritage they had because they were not able to read Giz. They were not studying, spending time on studying all these manuscripts we have. Um, one of the giants of those times, by the way, the, 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 the 1940s, 50s, it's called Iguala Gebra Johannes. One day we'll have to talk about this person. He's he's a giant. He he was he's still we are we are still yet to study him. He has this uh, little book published called It is it's amazing. It was delivered as a radio speech, like C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. <laughs> Imagine mere Christianity was not what he, he didn't sit down in his uh, office and thought about it to, to write a book. No, he didn't. C.S. Lewis didn't do that. He was preparing radio speeches, and those radio speeches end up being this classic book. The same happened for Iguala Gavra Johannes. Iguala Gavra Johannes, when Addis Ababa University, uh, the, by then it was Kadama Hale Selassie University, was um, uh, opened. Started, uh, the, began to function. He gave this speech on radios about how the, the indigenous knowledge needs to be integrated into or with the new kind of Western uh, thought system or knowledge or technology that we, are, we were trying to study. He said, that needs to be integrated with what we have because look what, it, I'm, I'm gonna mention this because this is very important. He said, Europeans and Ethiopians do not think alike. The European civilization is anthropocentric. Man is at the center of the European civilization, he says. The Ethiopian civilization, he said, is theocentric, God-centered. God is at the center of the Ethiopian civilization. Therefore, he said, when we take things from Europe, we need to integrate it into what we have integrate, like he was very, very, very um, uh, insistent on integrating what is from outside with what we have with the inside, uh, with the, uh, within. And- A cautious but, modernization, like a, huh? not, not a, it's not a stance against modernizing, mm -hmm. but to do so with extreme caution to make sure that the indigenous system is not supplanted by exactly. the uh, external system. Mm -hmm. Because he saw that, he saw the disaster that would, uh, you know, that could unleash that, that kind of um, div like divorce or kind of dichotomy or like it, it could create a schizophrenic generation. 
and to some extent that seems to have that to be like that seems to be the case like that that seems to be what have ha what has happened there a generation which is ethiopian national by nationality which is living in ethiopia and wants to serve ethiopia but has no idea what ethiopia is or what ethiopia has everything they they see that, that, that when you read what they were writing it's just terrifying they begin as oh you know everything is halakar everything is everything is just retarded so that's why by the way they tried when the so called revolution took over one of the institutions the societal institutions they attacked was the church <laughs> the church was attacked because not not just because the church the church had some corruption in, inside or not just because the church had um some uh, the, the, the people inside the church or the institution was a, in collaboration with the ancient regime. And not just that, there was inherent distaste. We can discern against the church in the writings of the 1960s, the 1970s. Look what they were writing. Look at their poems. There is one great, uh, he is a poet, a professor, and um, a, a, a very good teacher. He has uh, compiled, he, college, oh, he, he has compiled all those um, uh, poems college students used to recite in front of the emperor, <laughs> Emperor Raila Selassie. And you, look at that. How is the country represented? Backwarded, poor, we don't have anything, there is nothing, everything is bad. You begin there and <laughs> it's very difficult to go. So Gita Chohaile, however, was a different voice in that, gen in that time. Uh, I think that's why he, he, he had a hard time uh, to uh, get along with uh, the Derg regime. Uh, so, yeah. So he left the country and he came here, he came to, uh, in the West and he published a lot. And his publication, particularly those that were translated, um, I would, uh, yeah, no, it's not, it's not a good word to translate it. His publications that were written in Amharic, his publications that were published in Amharic, particularly, Dagika Stefanos, Barasa, um, and after, and after that, that's that's his uh, biography. <laughs> yes, all those things, I believe, had even a popular impact. Not just the academia; they had impacted the popular culture to some extent. I have one example to show this. There is this this uh, library we call uh, the Tamara Mariam, right? <laughs> After Getacho Haile's publication of Dr. Stefanos, look at the Tamara Mariam that was published. You don't find the Rayak of killing Dr. Stefanos. <laughs> No, no, that is just sanitized. That just gets sanitized. And I think this is because of Gita Chohaile bringing this um, Becky Castifano's uh, hagiographies and making them accessible to uh, the generation that doesn't know Giz but reads Samharic and very interested to know what its heritage was. And Gita Chohaile made that available and i don't know how many times that was published that um, the lucky castifanos I, I i don't really remember because it was just for for a long time it was very popular it was just just you'll see it in the market and people will be reading it and 
debate about it, talk about it. I saw someone made like a play out of it a few oh, years yeah. ago. <laughs> no wonder. <laughs> no, they, they, I, I, there certainly will be a movie. I would expect a movie because it's it's phenomenal. Like I, I love um, the the Deki Castifano's hagiography because they are not just um, into this very fantastic world of hagiography. Some of some hagiographies are like that. For instance, um, uh, Christos Semra's hagiography. You read that, and it's just like it is something it's talking about something beyond time and space it's all metaphor and allegory and it's not something that you you would like to take and kind of do a historical analysis now that's not that's not what it is but Dirk Castifanos tries to balance that it's a very different game I think and Gihad Chohaili by making that available he really uh, had impacted, I think, impacted the religious uh, thought, the religious discourse that exists in the Ethiopian church. Uh, and yeah, they, even Protestants read it and some Protestants tried to claim, to claim that, you know, they were they they Protestant. No, they were not. <laughs> no, they were not. They were sacramental and monastic. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. They, they will have nothing. It will be like... <laughs> yeah. It's not a case of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yeah, it, uh, yeah, it does work like that. They were one, one of the things people. from that book that touched me is this idea that I... We'll have to do another day, uh, and I know I know actually one of his daughters and and his grandsons on Professor Musfin, Wendamariam, and Professor Musfin had this dichotomy he talked about in the Ethiopian culture, and uh, you know, uh, I know you don't think as as much, but I I wonder too if the if the biological heritage has anything to do with it because it's very funny the way you described a Eurasian mindset versus an African mindset. And uh, of course, some of the biological studies have found traces of both of those things in Ethiopia. And so what Professor Mesfin identified is this tension between uh, this, um, maybe you could say oligarchical communitarian force, very community society, tallest blade of grass gets cut down. In Ducky Castifanos, you hear it by saying, this man teaches a teaching which is not from our country or not from our city. <laughs> and it's like, where did you get it from? <laughs> you outsider. Um, at the same time, he identifies the tension, Professor Musfin, of this hyper-individualism, which I think each of the modern kings of Ethiopia represent, especially Emperor Theodore or Theodros, you know, where it's this weird thing that we have a very communitarian society, but when someone acts as a pioneer and is hyper individualistic, the person is rewarded. If if they reach a high enough peak, they are rewarded. And in in a sense, Father Stephen was rewarded at least by some of those people for reaching a high enough peak, but not enough people. He didn't reach a high enough peak where everyone acknowledged it. Perhaps Emperor Zarayakob did, but he had his critics uh, as well. I just saw a new statue being built to him. Someone tagged me on Facebook, a new statue in Debra Berhan being built oh, to wow. him. <laughs> so it's well, uh... Kurbani Olenugus. <laughs> Kurbani Olenugus. I think that's how it's been, <laughs> they call it. Hmm. I, I didn't know that. Okay. I just hmm. saw it today. I just saw it today. So hmm. it, this is, it's an ongoing conversation. And Getat Juhaila, I posted a clip on my channel as well from a larger conversation that is found on Beit Eift, this talk he did on the Tambara Mariam library that you spoke about. Mm -hmm. And I think I had misread him, on, you know, at least according to what he said. It seemed like he was going to compare Mary and the depiction of Mary in the Wuddasi Mariam, in the praise of Mary, versus how she's uh, portrayed in the Ta'amra Mariam, the miracles of Mary. That's where I thought he was going. But when I asked him that question directly, there was, I think, some miscommunication. So I clarified in Amharic. And after clarifying in Amharic, 
he focused just on the depiction of Mary in this library of the miracles of Mary that you said. And he relayed to me this story I wasn't familiar with of a particular Egyptian bishop or patriarch or metropolitan, one of those things, who sent a letter. And he says he doesn't know if the letter ever made it to Ethiopia. He never verified it. But that in that letter, there was a rebuking of a particular representation of Mary. And he said, uh, you know, Nefsimar, uh, glad he, he went and peacefully fell asleep with the Lord. But he said, were he to explicate and expound upon this in very excruciatingly clear details in the right circles in Addis Ababa, today, even the giant that he is, he said, they might hang him. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how many people caught his joke, but I really thought that was funny that he said that. And that's this acknowledgement again, that we have this individualistic culture that rewards him for standing out in his generation, like you said, when all those people were speaking poems against the king and against the old order, the Ethiopian or the Afro-Asiatic ancien regime. At the same time, you know, the community that upholds him and, and respects him for that, he at least perceived could turn against him if the right circumstances were presented. He at least acknowledged that the threat was not just in the, the so-called <laughs> medieval or Solomonic period, but in the 21st century as well, he was walking with on his tippy toes. <laughs> yeah, he, he knows Ethiopia. I think he knows Ethiopians very well. <laughs> you see, like that's his life. He studies Ethiopians. He studies the he studies Ethiopians. He lives with Ethiopians. He's an Ethiopian. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I understand his um, his caution because he knows people might not might not get the whole um, picture. So when they hear something, they take that and put it in the context that they have in their mind. And that produces a very different meaning than the, the meaning that was intended by the speaker. So that he knows that that creates a lot of problem in our society, particularly in, around the church. So yeah, I, it's no wonder that he was very careful. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, you see, Zaraya of um, and Abai um are figures to be studied on their own. This is what I believe. We do not have to take the whole uh, 15th century and put everybody together and say that this is the theology or the, the, the Mariology or the, the um, thought system of 15th century Ethiopia, Ethiopian church. This is the theology. Like I would say, um, I would be a little hesitant. Like, no, it's better to do it differently, individually. Zarayakov is Zarayakov, Bagyorgis is a Bagyorgis. And when we study these figures on their own, we understand what trends of thought were playing in the church. Because sometimes um, their theologies are not um, in concurrence, in congruence. <laughs> so, and everyone has their own, their theology based on some other things. So they need to be studied on their own. And people do not understand that. Uh, so the Ryakov is, if you oppose the Ryakov, people say, or if you oppose something, uh, again, if you oppose uh, something that uh, was written or attributed to the Ryakov, people can consider you that you are attacking the church. <laughs> you see, he knows that, like people are sensitive. So he knows that, that's why he doesn't want to touch. Okay, <laughs> yeah, let's put this for another time. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not the time to deal with it now. 
Is that the context? Yeah, he knows that. Yeah. He's he's an Ethiopian. Yeah. So he he was a linguist. He was he, his contribution also extends to historiography. Um, he is also, uh, in a way. Uh, a language planner. <laughs> That's what we call a person, a language planner in, in sociolinguistics. When a person intentionally uh, changes or the, the, uh, a language policy, he becomes a language planner. So he was a language planner. He was a scholar. And he was also uh, a church man. By the way, uh, he could have been a priest, but he said, no, I don't, I do not want to be a priest. <laughs> he refused. Like, he, I think he was asked repeatedly. And he said, no, I do not want to be a priest. I don't think that's my vocation. Do, do you think that would, he perceived it as tarnishing his objectivity in approaching certain things? Or, mm. or that it just wasn't his, simply his calling that in terms of the, the ministerial duties that would yes, be. Yes, I think I, I, I think I will, yeah, I would take the latter because he seems to be from what I have read in his biography. It was impressive how it, like he was clear about it. Like, I do not want to be a priest because to be a priest is a ministerial, it's, it's a big call. And you need to have that call to get into that ministry. If you do not have that call, it's not something you go and get ordained just because you are going to be you know, applauded and you're gonna get all the attention in the parish. You're gonna be praised by everyone because you have such a beautiful voice. And oh my goodness, when he moves around, moves about the liturgy, he's just, he flows like an angel. Yeah, that's called idolatry. <laughs> and <laughs> I think Gilad Jalin knew his call. He knew where he can serve the Lord, where he can serve the church, where he can contribute. So he knew his call, and this, I think he lived out his call by writing extensively, publishing extensively, and teaching people extensively. Like he, uh, uh, if there is any um, great Ethiopian studies person who are very much into Ethiopian manuscripts, they, that person certainly have met Gita Chohaili at least once and everybody talks about him very, very great, graciously. He's a very collegial person, they say. And, uh, today earlier I was reading what um, uh, Ted Erhol wrote from uh, St. John's University, uh, the, the, um, uh, VHMML, uh, the HMML library, the HMML library. So did he. Yes. He said, he, he mentioned his collegiality. Yes. He was very, very generous to know and to share what he knows and to, to teach people what he has, and which was really uh, immense. And there is one person whom he often mentions and is very grateful to, and his name is Amaha Asfaw. I don't know that person, but wherever that person is, if he is alive, thank you for making Gita Chohaile accessible to us. Because he was the one who typed, I think, some of his Amharic um, publications. And I think he encouraged him. Uh, even in on was it on ResearchGate? On ResearchGate, there is uh, Getacho Haile has a page, and on that page, or oh, I think you have uh, a few of his Amharic um, publications are uh, to be found there, and all, I think all of them are dedicated to Amhasfa. And I think that person encouraged him to write in Amharic. I think, and I really would like to thank him for that, for making this great scholar accessible to Ethiopians, not just the Westerners because he was writing in English, but he made him accessible to Ethiopians by perhaps encouraging him to write in Amharic. So I would like to thank him. I'm, I'm well. I don't know you, but thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, that's right. yeah, we can talk about him, but I think. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's it, that point about the priesthood is, you know, it's something uh, we can talk about definitely off camera as well, but it's something 
a lot of people want to thrust at me and I I think I'll probably follow Professor or um, Acho in in this regard. Um, and yeah, on, okay. on on the priesthood by John Chrysostom <laughs> is something that anyone having these considerations I think would do well to reflect on. And I don't know whether or not Professor Gattaccio read it, but perhaps he did. And and you can be swayed in different directions. Obviously, John Chrysostom then <laughs> became more than a priest, but a bishop. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, even though he wrote that, it, it's an interesting text. I also think earlier what you were talking about, the, the two figures that are within the church of Emperor Zariakob, not to be confused with the philosopher, and Abba Stifanos, the way in which you take that, or even Abba Georgi Zagasicha, Zasagala, John Chrysostom, and Cyril of Alexandria are figures like that also to be grappled with. And you and I, I think in another space, we'll, we'll cover that at length too. But there are these tensions in the church and yet the, the church is there on a, on a more personal note. I know we made this about him, but just because I have you here, you too are the son of a cantor. <laughs> you too are a church man. You too are interested in theology. You too are a linguist, philologist, however it is you're going to I, I identify. So, you know, you are one seed amongst many that he's, he's sown out there and he's sown, you know, so many. We'll see what type of uh, merit or, or ground uh, <laughs> yes. the seed has been sown in. But yes. is, is, there, um, is there anything that you'd like the audience to know that you're personally doing to carry that torch or carry that baton further? And it's not to you know, set you apart or glorify, give you come to what does say, right? False praise, but then to use you know, whatever it is that you're doing to continue in the legacy to show people how, how they can as well. I think the bare minimum they can do is to begin reading his work. So I'm going to put the research gate link up on the YouTube, wherever they see this, and I'll try to put it on audio platforms as well so that people can go to Amazon and purchase his books, but you can also go to research gate or JSTOR for that matter. And you can go and, and read his publications. Yes. And also, like, uh, I forgot one thing. Githacho Haile was also an activist. <laughs> that's that's one thing I was trying to mention. And uh, You uh, mentioned my, it in, in a bit in, in reference it, to... Yeah, yeah, the historical, uh, the, all these um, false historical narratives about Ethiopian ethnic groups and dividing them and just pitching everybody against everyone. Like, he, he refused that. He just he refuted that. Like, I think, like no other scholar, because he knows the history of the country because he was really dealing with all these Zena Moa'ils and all these Gedlat. He knows the manuscripts, he has read them and he knows how the, the different ethnic groups used to interact with one another. And he knows that because he knows the country of the, the history of the country, like he had no patience for this nonsense <laughs> that was invented because uh, from people who have no idea about the, the history of the country in the 1960s and 70s. So he was an activist. He used to write extensively on uh, Facebook. He used to write on Facebook. He used to write on blogs. Seriously, like he, he was so adamant to tell the, the, the regime that you people are wrong. You are destroying the country. You are pitching, trying to pitch everyone against everyone. This is not how it's, things were supposed to be. He, he wrote extensively, extensively on that uh, uh, as an activist also. So Yudhacho Haile is a multi-layered person. And um, yeah, uh, I would like to say this. Um, we have a department of philology back home that there are, we have philologists in Ethiopia. And all those philologists honestly are, can be considered as somehow fruits of the fruits of the labors of Gitacho Haile and all, 
all the all that batch uh, of Gita China, like um, uh, Tadis Tamrat, uh, Sergab, particularly Sergab Lesselassie and Gita Chayali, and also Tadis Tamrat, and all, and we can fare, can I, can I fare with them like, and all, there, there are just many. Well, whatever Ethiopian studies um, scholars, Ethiopian scholars who are doing Ethiopian studies now. They are the fruits of, I believe, they are, we are, all of us are the fruits of Geta Chohaili and all the people who toiled to lay the foundations of Ethiopian studies and made it accessible to us. Not just write it and shelf it somewhere in, in the Western libraries, but write it and make it accessible to Ethiopian students. Uh, so Gita Chohaili has so many fruits in that regard, I believe. And uh, so hopefully, yes, I will keep, uh, I'll continue studying Gita Chohaili's works. I will keep studying Ethiopian manuscripts. I have been privileged to study Ethiopian manuscripts at the Princeton University and the Catholic University of America where I'm uh, doing my PhD. So God willing, I will continue to study the Ethiopian fathers as I study the church, the, the, the early church fathers like St. Ephraim and uh, St. John Chrysostom and <laughs> Isaac the Syria. As I study those, I also will keep studying the Ethiopian fathers because it is the Ethiopian fathers who mediated all these church fathers to us as far as they could, as far as they understood, as far as they had access to. So I will continue studying these fathers uh, and I will try to pass whatever little I have learned through my studies to the next generation by writing in Amharic and learning more, a little more languages and strengthening my Tigrinya and Afano Romo and probably writing in Afano Romo and Tigrinya too, hopefully <laughs> one day. Berta. Yes. <laughs> um, but on, on that note, um, about the priesthood, though, um, when you read the church fathers, <laughs> because this is a very sensitive topic to me, <laughs> when you read the church fathers, do not read the church father just just sing, like singularly. You study them individually, but you don't sing you don't study them singularly. In a state, you study them together. If you are studying John Chrysostom's on the priesthood, please also read. Uh, Grigory the Great, <laughs> okay. Grigory, the, the, what what is his uh, work? That that uh, that great work. Um, what was it? I, I have it here. Sorry, <laughs> I I the I, I lost the title. Please, uh, okay. all, Gregory uh, yeah. the Great. Yes, please also study Gregory the Great. Uh, uh, pastoral rule, yes, on the pastoral rule, and also Saint Ambrose of Milan's uh, on the priesthood, like on the priests about the priesthood. So integrate them because I'm saying this. Saint John Chrysostom, he's yes, I, uh, he's, it's a beautiful writing. That writing is a beautiful writing. But don't forget this: he cheated his friend. <laughs> he cheated his friend and, and made him get like he he made him to be ordained, but he is kept that ordination first, but guess what? Guess what happened? He was kidnapped, put into the carriage and <laughs> sent all the way to Constantinople. And he was ordained, even though he was crying and screaming and kicking against it. <laughs> so that's an only God. <laughs> you see the priesthood, uh, um, very recently I was reading this from Archmandrite Meletius Weber. I'm reading his book. Uh, it, it's, it's a good oil book. and water. Yes, it's a good book. Bread very, and very water, good, wine and very oil. Very great book. Yes, and he said this: the church does not ordain, like, uh, does not ordain the person because he wants it, or because she like he is fit, or because um, people think that he will be a great guy if he becomes. Uh, <laughs> A, a priest. No. 
the church ordains the person when she sees fit, when she sees that he she wants him, she needs him, she ordains him. She has absolute right on that person. Don't forget that because you are her member. You are just part of the body. <laughs> okay, because you are part of the body, you cannot say no. By the way, in the um, uh, Antiochian and the, the, the Greek uh, liturgical rites, when a person is to be ordained, I love that that um, the ordination ceremony. It's, it's the first time I saw it. Honestly, I have to I have to tell you, I cried the first time I saw it. <laughs> I just wept. <laughs> it was just so beautiful. I wept. Um, what what they do is they grab the deacon who was to be who was to be who is to be ordained into the priesthood. They two people grab from both sides and they circulate him around the altar like a sacrifice. And they made him kiss the altar four times, like only in, in all the cardinal directions. Because he is the sacrifice. He is going to be sacrificed right there. So they grab him because he is that that uh, tradition, that um, kind of grabbing two like two people grabbing him and bringing him to the altar. Probably it was it started because people used to refuse to be ordained, <laughs> like Saint John Chrysostom. <laughs> so when the church believe when the church thinks that she wants you to be a priest. You can say no. You can only say, yes, ma'am, and here I am. Because it is not the bishop who makes you a priest. It's the Holy Spirit. It's a transformation. <laughs> As in the in the Latin in the Latin tradition, they say ontological change. They say <laughs> Ont you be ontological, you are a different being after that. <laughs> they say. <laughs> yeah, well. So the church has an absolute right. <laughs> she can make you as Ali Hohit, she can make you the patriarch. <laughs> so there is, <laughs> so I, I, uh, as much as I appreciate Gita Cho Haile's um, insistence on not having the call, and the church didn't insist on him even though he was requested, he, the request was presented to him. When he said no, it, it was a no. And I think people respected his, his uh, refusal because they saw that maybe he doesn't have the vocation to do it. Maybe the church doesn't steal it. The church saw, okay, maybe he doesn't have the vocation. Don't forget that St. Ambrose of Milan, he was not even a deacon. He was a catechumen. <laughs> Before they ordained, <laughs> before he was baptized, he was elected the Bishop of Milan. He was a catechumen. He was a new Christian. The church said, I want that guy. I want that guy to be my bishop. And he said, here I am. She baptized him. In a week, he is the Bishop of Milan. And Milan was like the New York of the time, okay? <laughs> so if the church wants to, she can do it. <laughs> Stop kicking and screaming. Even if you do that, <laughs> if the church wants, we can bring you by dragging you as an offering. Gurum mazakar, gurum zakr tazkar. Thank you. Barana. Karas aun na kumo. 